<laughs> oh. <laughs> We're live. Hi, everybody. Happy Monday evening or Monday afternoon or possibly very early in the morning, wherever you may be. It is a cold, rainy, windy day in southern Ontario. So uh, we are all cozied up. I've got a blanket over my lap. I've got a nice hot cup of tea. So does Mr. and Stitches. And uh, we thought we would we would get right into a nice sort of cozy crochet chat this evening. So um, if you're in a cool spot, we hope you warm you up. And uh, and if you're in a really hot spot, then uh, I hope you can put your feet up and relax and, and cool down a little bit. Um, it's it's time to uh, to just um, relax and to sort of indulge in our favorite little hobby. <laughs> <laughs> this warm tea is really helping. It is. It's very yeah. it's, it's It's great, I have to say. Cannot believe how cold it is today. It's not normally like this. So if we sound kind of whiny... <laughs> That's why usually by usually by mid May it's nice, you we, know. It's the rain kind going, of has already happened. We are and... going to be complaining for this entire yeah, it's live just stream. Just be a big whine. Just one big whine fest, <laughs> like whining and complaining. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Um, yeah. So one of the biggest questions we get asked, uh, and increasingly, is how to read patterns. So we thought we would we would approach this uh, from a couple of angles. So we are going to talk about how to read written patterns tonight. I am going to take you through the entire thing, the how they're written, how they look, um, the stuff you should look for, the commonalities in patterns, um, things that might distinguish a pattern that's like maybe really old versus really new, all that stuff. And and then about a week from now, we're going to do a live tutorial and we're going to actually do a pattern together. So the one we'll be doing, just so you know, here's everybody's homework. We have a bunch of free written patterns on our website. Um, Mr. and Stitches will put that link in the little chat box. And we'll also make sure that link is under this video once the live stream is done later. Uh, we have a bunch. They're on the pattern workshop page. So if you've never been to our website, uh, all of the, the different pages that belong to our website are all listed across the top. And when you land, there's um, a little video to help kind of a, can familiarize you with the entire site, or you can just start jumping in between the pages. And the pattern workshop is where we put all of our free patterns. Might I add, we do have one secret pattern that is not on the pattern workshop page. <laughs> we do? Yes, we, we have a pattern on um, oh, is that the Institchable? I I'm not sure if it's on the Institchable page. It's the cup, the the cup warmer one. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's just that one. Okay. So that one, that one's on one of the other pages. If anyone wants, uh... I don't know where Mister Institches put that. So you might <laughs> no, not even I remember where I put it. <laughs> But 99.9% .9 of them are on the Pattern yes. Workshop page. Uh, yeah, and there's a bunch of them there. And they, they range all over the place from really, you know, short and simple and concise to a lot more in-depth. Many of them have tutorials that go with them. And many of them, um, a handful of them don't, but are kind of based on the concept that once you've gotten used to reading our patterns and following along, you can follow along with those patterns too. Um, so the one we're going to be doing next week is this one. It's the Moss Stitch Ditch Cloth. You know me, I love dish cloths and washcloths. I also love the, the Moss Stitch. And we haven't done a tutorial on this pattern. We just sort of wrote up the pattern and put it up on the site uh, several years ago because uh, we'd used the Moss Stitch in a couple of other projects. And I had made this because I like to experiment with a stitch and I like to make a dishcloth. And uh, while I was experimenting, I kind of wrote it up. We put it up on the website and a lot of people have asked if we could do a tutorial on it. So next week, we're going to do a live tutorial. We're going to do the moss dish, moss stitch dish cloth and we are going to follow along the pattern. So I'll literally have the pattern lying on the desk and as we're working on it, I will be pointing to all the different spots on the pattern to kind of help you see um, how a pattern becomes an actual physical thing. But today we're going to, I'm just going to take you through all the different parts of a pattern. I'm going to talk about the things that you'll see in the instructional part of a pattern that you might find confusing. This certainly, these are the things that kind of had me going, what, when I first started reading patterns? Um, and all the different sections that you can look for, and they may be hiding. So it depends on where you get your patterns, but we're going to get into that. First, I'm going to have a little sip of tea. I will complain about how cold it is today. <laughs> it really is cold. It is very, very cold. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't have to have the pattern 
today. But if you did want to grab it, you could always zip over to the website or open it up in another um, uh, another window and just either download it or uh, click on the PDF and open it up, just look at it or just send it to your printer, whatever you want to do. But you don't have to have this today. Uh, you can certainly always come back and look at this later. But there are sections. Most patterns are laid out in sections. You'll find um, that they generally start with a title. And if some of this sounds kind of like, really, Jada? <laughs> I think it's important to go through every single thing that you would probably find in a pattern because most patterns have a lot in common. And most patterns have a title. Sometimes you'll come across a pattern that doesn't and doesn't have any photographs either. And it can be really confusing. You're kind of going, well, is what is this for? <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Thank you. <laughs> I have to interrupt. We have a super chat oh. from Killafoo. Killafoo. <laughs> Hello, Killafoo. <laughs> Thank you. The super chat says, could you do a tutorial on a midwife blanket? A midwife blanket? You mean like... That's the one from that show. Okay, just to be clear, is it I'm, the I'm, one that is commonly called the midwife blanket from that show that's a specific stitch? Or are you referring <laughs> to like something that midwives use? Because... <laughs> <laughs> there could be a couple of things there. Okay, Killifu will clarify. Thank and you, Killifu. Also, um, also, have you used the 24-7, 100% <laughs> mercerized cotton? 24-7? Yeah, 24-7, 100% 100% <laughs> mercerized? 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 I don't know how to... Some people, we all yeah, sort of say it Yeah, is it mercer or mercer? Mercerized. Um, I have crochet thread. I have a whole bunch right here, as a matter of fact. Actually, that one's a bit. I'll grab this one instead. Come here, you. Um, this is the crochet thread. I have a lot of, um, it's all cotton, all my crochet thread, but I don't think I have anything. If 24 7 is a brand, I don't think I have any of that. I have a lot of Aunt Lydia's, I have a lot of South Made. Um, that's pretty much all I have Aunt Lydia's and South Made, and then a lot that doesn't have its labels anymore because. Uh, I've sort of inherited a bunch of these from from older members of the family. <laughs> uh, so no, I haven't I haven't found that or tried it. So I'll um, I'll make a note. Twenty seven. Kilifu says yes. So I'm guessing it's yes. The blanket specific to that show. The stitch that's the commonly, stitch okay. that's commonly used. At, for that show and talked about in regards yeah, to that's that a show. really that's an old pattern that's kind of a take on uh fillet crochet it's a really basic um take on fillet crochet which is uh probably why it um jumped to popularity because it's beautiful and it's super simple and fillet crochet is a lot of fun it looks complicated yeah it looks yeah. complicated but it's not it's not at all so i've actually kind of looks actually messed around it looks with that a bit yeah it's really pretty Something uh, it looks like something my grandmother used to make for the for the um, kitchen table. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It has that kind of. Yeah, well, it's filling it, crochet. It has, it's that, really, look, really it has that look to it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Back to patterns. How to read a pattern. All right. So besides a pattern having a title, a pattern will often have a byline that says who it's by. Um, this can get a little muddy on the internet because uh, there are a lot of crochet patterns on the internet that aren't necessarily associated with anything or anyone, or sometimes you might stumble onto a crochet pattern that's in somebody's blog. So it won't necessarily have all that information um, kind of all contained in the same area. So you might have to do a little digging. The, the internet's sort of a strange place. It's wonderful because it's full of lots of crochet resources, but some of them can be a little disjointed and hard to find. Uh, so name and a byline, those are two things that most patterns have and they probably should because it's nice to know what you're making and, and who made it and sometimes when it was made. A lot of crochet patterns are really old. Uh, vintage patterns might not have um, anybody who wrote them, or they could be reinterpreted by someone. Um, sometimes patterns are so old and there's they've been passed down for so long, somebody has taken the opportunity to write it down or to try to reinterpret it in a way that makes sense on paper, uh, or maybe is a little easier to follow. And so it's not like it was invented by that person, but it was definitely written by that person. Um, so it can get a little bit, a little bit money, but title and a byline, those are things that patterns all typically have. First and foremost, in terms of importance, <laughs> materials. 
So your pattern should always have materials listed. Um, this is so you know what kind of yarn you should be using uh, or looking for, or if it's a particular fiber you should use. It'll tell you what hook you should use, so what hook size, and anything else you might need to complete the pattern, like scissors or a yarn needle or stuffing. <laughs> it's tea time, mm -hmm. and we have a super chat. Oh my goodness. From Michael. Michael, thank you. Uh, Michael says, I just wanted to thank you for what you do. Aww. I never thought I could learn the chevron stitch until I watched your video. Much love to you and Mr. and Stitches. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I love that. That is That, for example, is a classic pattern. And the chevron comes in a myriad of different kinds of patterns. The, the chevron stitch has been re- imagined so many times you could literally make a different chevron blanket like every year and still not run out of chevron patterns to follow <laughs> it's wonderful i just love that classic wave it's such a nice such a nice pattern yes so materials that should be somewhere near the top of your pattern when you get a pattern materials are going to be one of the first things that are indicated make sure you read through it next you might have a stitch a stitch legend. So if you've ever read maps or any other kind of document that has a legend, a legend is essentially the definitions of the shorthand that will be used in the document you're reading. So this is very important. It's also very important, I'm probably going to, you're going to hear me say this a lot, to read the entire pattern before you start. So I know most of you, when you get into crochet and you first learn how to crochet and that world opens up and your brain opens up and all those opportunities and possibilities are, are just exploding in front of you. It's really difficult to not just jump in. <laughs> you want to make sure you read the whole pattern. And I mean, read everything, read every sentence, read every line, read every single part of the pattern first and read it out loud. When you're saying something out loud, you're hearing it and it will often help explain it to you. So if you're just reading something in your, you know, in your head, it might not make any sense, especially if there's a lot of shorthand or short forms used. And that can become frustrating and upsetting. And then you might just say, oh, I can't read patterns and you'll walk away. No. <laughs> read the whole thing. Pay close attention to the legend. And if you see something in the written body of the pattern that doesn't make sense, Go back and look at the legend because there's probably something there that explains it. <laughs> Kathy says, why am I going to read a pattern when I have you, sweetie? <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Aww, that's cute. Well, there, there are, um, the videos are fantastic um, to see it all happen it's great in to have real video time. Tutorial. Yeah. Um, however, sometimes patterns are good because you, you can don't take have, them with you. You can take them with you. You can bring them to areas that you can't have your maybe your phone or your on phone or your battery or dead or you're in the car and you want to save your battery. Your tablet doesn't work. It's and just, it's, all, it's always nice to have a quick reference. There is a world of written patterns out there. Um, there are magazines and books. There are entire library sections. There are huge um, sort of... What do you call it when you, uh, in a museum, when you curate? There's massive curated areas on the internet of patterns. There's something on the internet called the Wayback Machine, and you'll find just, <laughs> just fabulous stuff that's all crochet patterns that there are no tutorials for. So if you can read patterns, it just opens up that world of possibility for you, uh, like 200-fold. There are so much more crochet written down than there is put into a video or a tutorial or even even photograph tutorials photograph tutorials are super helpful too um but even they are dwarfed by the sheer amount of written pattern that is that is out there uh so it's that's why i, I guess i get so excited about about written patterns and about being able to read patterns because um they just i, I <laughs> you could fill you could fill entire bookshelves in your house with patterns and never even make them all but there are there are just so many and there are so many beautiful variations on things and there's so many old ones and there's lace and there's sweaters and there's just oh my gosh yeah so it's good to read patterns <laughs> because sometimes you might think oh my gosh i want to make that but there is no video tutorial or there is no photograph tutorial for you so if you can read the pattern it's literally having another language it is super helpful to have another language 
So after the material section, there's usually the stitch legend. Make sure you pay attention to the stitch legend. It will usually highlight all of the different terminologies that you'll find um, short formed in the body of the instructions of the pattern. So for example, uh, on one of our patterns in our stitch legend, we always say things like R equals row because we title every row with an R. Not every pattern is written the same way. Just like no two books are written the same way, no two authors necessarily write a pattern exactly the same way. There's always a unique style to a pattern, but they do tend to follow a certain similar concept. Like most books in the Western world are read, you know, uh, cover to cover, uh, left to right, top of the page to the bottom of the page. Uh, written patterns follow certain rules as well. So that's how you read books. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Been struggling with that mm -hmm. system. <laughs> Silly. We have a super chat from Emily. Emily, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Emily. Emily says, Hi, Jada. Can you do a video tutorial on making plarn sometime? Yes. The yarn made with plastic bags. Yes. Can yes. you? Th uh, thank you for everything you do. I will write that down. We've actually been considering doing that. We did a we did a um, a video on t-shirt yarn. Making your own t-shirt. And the yarn. the technique is very very similar. Uh, but yeah, that's a good idea because um, more and more of us have are kind of trying to use up our plastic bags so that we don't end up having them lying around the house anymore. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> uh, so the Stitch Legend will have all of the short forms explained for you. So if something shows up in the body of your of the instructions of your pattern and it doesn't make sense, go check out the Stitch Legend and that's usually somewhere near the beginning of the pattern. <laughs> we have a new member. Yay! Welcome, Nancy. Hi, Nancy, welcome to the family. <laughs> Um, there are a few other sections at the beginning of a pattern that you might look for. Not all patterns will have them, um, but if, like I said, always read your entire pattern start to finish before you get into it because everything that's in that pattern is there for a reason. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there. So make sure you read through every single section. Don't just sort of jump the notes, jump the... If there's a section that says notes, read these first or notes or, you know, important notes or things to keep in mind or some kind of section like that. Read them. The bullet points or the little sentences that are contained in a note section often refer to the overall concept of the pattern or things to keep in mind while you're working on the pattern or general rules that that pertain to that pattern specifically. So, for example, sometimes when we're doing a tutorial and let's say, for example, like the little cat purse that we just did, this pattern was worked in the round which means that unless I say so, we're just working from one row to another. We're not joining the rows with a slip stitch. We're just working around and around and around. So that might be something you'd see in the note section. You know, this pattern is worked in the round. Do not join your rows because some of us have a tendency to join rows or because it's, you know, a habit we got into. Maybe we've done a lot of patterns where you always join your row. It, the note section tries to account for things that you might assume that it doesn't want you to. For example, not joining rows when maybe your tendency would be to do that. Uh, another thing you would probably find in the note section is a bit about the construction of the pattern. So for example, if there's a stitch count that you should have at the end of a row, it'll tell you where to find it. Typically at the end of that row of instructions, there'll be a little stitch count. Um, it'll maybe tell you the measurements you might be looking for, um, some general things to keep in mind, like your gauge or um, maybe, you know, keep an eye on your tension, whatever the author thinks you should probably keep in mind while you're working through that project. They will include that information in the notes or the little write up about of the project. It's very important that you read that. Uh, one of the reasons that we typically do introductions to our tutorials is so that we can introduce you to the project. We might want to tell you something about the yarn we're using or something about uh, the reason for making the project or uh, something about the fiber that we're using. And we feel it's important enough that we want to say it up front so that we're not just including it halfway through the tutorial. And that's kind of the importance of the note section or the introduction to the pattern. So make sure you read that. Two other things you might see up front before you even get to the instructions of a pattern are a special stitch section or um, what often is called the pattern stitch or the pattern notes. If a pattern or a project 
like a blanket or a sweater, something large that might be using a specific stitch pattern. Uh, like for example, I've got my my granny uh, granny stitch, my granny shell, straight granny shell blanket with me today. It's very chilly in here. Complain, complain. Um, if you were making a blanket that was the shell stitch, uh, the granny shell stitch, in the special stitch section, you might see something that says shell or shell stitch. And then an actual definition of what the shell stitch is as it pertains to that pattern. So that's another thing I want you all to kind of have in the back of your head. One of the, a very common question we hear is, I thought a shell was five, you know, double crochets, or I thought a fan was five double crochets. Just because you've read something described in a particular pattern one way, doesn't mean that that's the, that's the ground rule for the entire crochet universe. Crochet developed very organically across many, many hands in many, many locations. And so while the techniques all tend to be very similar to each other, what we tend to call things or what maybe something gets called in a particular pattern isn't necessarily going to be exactly the same thing in the next pattern you come to. Because like, for example, fans can be any number of double crochets so long as it creates a fan look. Um, so if for a specific pattern, the author might say, for this pattern, a fan is five double crochets worked into the same stitch or space. So while you're working that particular pattern, that's how you make a fan. Doesn't matter if, you know, six patterns later, they're telling you that uh, the fan is seven double crochets worked in whatever that specific stitch tells you in that specific pattern is what that author wants in that pattern. So the special stitch section or the stitchery or the pattern stitch section will give you the definition of the basic concept of the pattern. If there is one, there isn't always. So for example, in something like, um, uh, a little amigurumi or a little stuffed bag or some tiny little project like this, there won't be a special stitch. There is no stitch pattern uh, to follow. You're just basically doing single crochets and then the actual instructions are in the body that are more important. Um, but if it's something like a blanket or a sweater, there might actually be like a stitch pattern or a stitch guide to read and pay attention to because it'll refer to it quite often in the body of the pattern. She says, grabbing a quick, a quick sip of tea. Opportunity for me to jump in there. <laughs> we have a super chat from Robbie. Hi, Robbie. Thank you. And Robbie says, I made my mom the crochet basket for Mother's Day, and she loved it. Perfect. Now she wants me to teach her how I did it. Aww. So we're planning a fun crochet day. Oh, I love Aww, that. Aw, that's sweet. That is so sweet. It's sort of like the Mother's Day gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah, I like, I like that. A lot of baskets, baskets are a great gift. I mean, they're super useful for tidying up, but I mean, who doesn't like a nice pretty so basket? So useful, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay, so that's a stitch, a stitchery or a stitch, a uh, pattern stitch guide or a stitch area, special stitches section. Make sure you read that as well because it'll, it'll just define the stitch that will be referred to or used predominantly throughout and they want you to be comfortable with it um, and understand it, excuse me, before you get into the body of the project. One more thing you might find up front before you get into all the instructions in a pattern is something called a gauge. Gauges are typically important for things that where sizing is important, like clothing. So you won't always see a gauge on a pattern. You'll only see it if it's deemed important for the outcome of the pattern. Like if you're going to make yourself a sweater, you want to know what the gauge is so that you don't just jump into it with any hook and any yarn and end up with a sweater that's 80 times too big or 80 times too small. Um, I would like to just mention that there's a lot of really good questions coming in in regards to reading patterns, but I don't want to um, throw you off your okay. um, script of what you wanted to talk about. I have a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know you have a lot. So what we'll do is if everyone can just hold on to their questions and then we'll uh, repeat them near the end, uh, we'll let everyone know when we're getting close to the end and repeat them and then Jada can get to them then. Hopefully too, you'll hear your questions answered because I'm, I'm gonna try and go through the basic construction of a pattern. Yeah. Um, and hopefully I'll explain all that stuff as I get there. And for those of you that aren't um, aware, you can rewatch this live stream later anytime you want. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Stitches. You're welcome. 
Uh, okay, so the gauge is very important, and I'm not just saying that because <laughs> I'm I I have been very guilty of just jumping into projects and ignoring the gauge. I figured, oh, I got the exact yarn it told me to, and I'm using the exact size hook it told me to, so I'm going to skip the gauge. Don't do that. We are all so unique that our personal stitch tension varies greatly from person to person. Um, our individual hooks, depending on the manufacturer, could change. Um, they they may, you, you could even have two hooks that are the same size that are maybe one's in line and one's tapered, or they're from two completely different manufacturers, and you will find that you crochet differently with them, even though they're the same sized hook. So you really should do the gauge first because the yarn you got might be a little thinner than the one that the author had, or maybe a little bit thicker. And a gauge is typically just a little sample swatch. This also plays in to the stitch pattern. So you might see these two things come hand in hand, especially if you're making a blanket or a piece of clothing. You'll see the stitch pattern or the stitch guide saying, you know, this is the pattern um, it looks like this, that's a fan, followed by a, a V or whatever the pattern is. And then the gauge will say, chain 25, work in pattern stitch for 10 rows, and then it'll give you a measurement. So what that means is they're telling you to chain that foundation number, go to the little stitch guide, the area of the pattern that describes how the stitch pattern works, and practice that stitch pattern before you've gotten anywhere near starting the project. Work that stitch pattern for as many rows as you're told to, and then measure it with your measuring tape. And if your measurements come out to be the same as the guide, go ahead and start the project. If they come out to be a little bit bigger, that means that your tension is looser, your hook is bigger, or your yarn is thicker, so a heavier weight, which means you either need to change your yarn, downsize your hook, or try to crochet tighter. It's usually easier to downsize your hook. If you measure your little stitch sampler and your gauge comes out to measure smaller than the gauge indicated in the pattern, this means you need to, you've either crocheted too tightly, your hook is too small, or your yarn is too thin or too light. So you need to upsize the weight of your yarn or use a slightly larger hook or try to relax your stitchery. So usually the easiest thing to do is to change your hook whenever you're dealing with gauges because our tension tends to, to even itself out and whatever your tension has become while you've worked that little stitch guide or that little stitch sampler, that's typically how you're going to work throughout the whole project. So larger hook if you were too small, smaller hook if you were too large. So keep that in mind. And always, always, always do the gauge. <laughs> I made a cute little baby jacket once for a new cousin of mine and I didn't bother with the gauge and she finally could fit into it when she was two years old. So <laughs> <laughs> trust me, it still worked out. Mm. But you definitely want to do the gauge. So those are all the things you, you should see before you've even launched into the pattern. Then the actual pattern. So this is where all the actual, the meat of it is, all the different instructions. <laughs> That itself could be broken up into different sections too. So this is why I say read the whole thing through and read it out loud to yourself uh, because hearing it out loud helps you make sense of it better because it's not always written in plain sentences. There's a lot of short form in the description of a pattern. And what, can I just say that that's good practice for everything that's instruction related? <laughs> I know we, as human beings, we tend to just like... I can put together that I can cabinet. just slap it together, but <laughs> read it through, read it through, read it through. <laughs> read it through, yeah. Really do. Uh, before you continue, <laughs> we have a super chat from Melody. Melody. Thank you, Melody. Melody says, thanks for all you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just, we just said... Think it through, really do. And I'm like, yeah, keep that in your head. Read it, Think through, it through, read it through, really, really do. do. Thanks for all you do. <laughs> really do, read it through. <laughs> really do, read it through, think it through. Really do, read it through. Really do, read it through. You really, really do want to read it through because you, if you say a sentence and it doesn't make sense, you go back and you read it, you go, okay, what didn't make sense here? Oh, there's a short form. What's SC mean? Well, let me go look at the stitch legend. Uh, SC, ah, single crochet. Okay, let me go back and read that sentence again. 
single crochet into the second chain. Okay, now it makes sense. Your your uh, your percentage of making a mistake drops dramatically. Yes. If you read it through. Yeah. It really does. It goes from like 70% chance of an error to like maybe 10 or 20% chance. It's really true. <laughs> and there's another reason for that. As you're reading through the pattern and you're, you're kind of, you're reading it row by row in your brain, I want you to be crocheting it row by row. It doesn't matter if you're not super good at, at imagining things, you know, by this point, <laughs> how wide a row would probably be if it's in double crochet or how tiny a row might be if it was just slip stitches. You read it through row by row, and then maybe the pattern changes halfway through. Maybe all of a sudden you're, you know, working on a completely different chunk of, let's say it's a sweater. You get comfortable reading a section and you think, I know how this is done. But then all of a sudden you're looking at the sleeve. Well, the sleeve has tapering and maybe it ends with a rib stitch. It's a completely different stitch pattern. You want to read the whole pattern all the way through so that you know what's coming and there's no surprises. And by the time you get to these other places, you're like, okay, I know what's coming next. I know that I've worked on this part. I know what to expect there. I know what's coming next. It's very important to read it through. Uh, the pattern will typically go by row. You will generally start with, it might say foundation row. It might just tell you to chain. Typically, if a pattern tells you to begin with a chained foundation row, you start that with a slip stitch. So depending on the pattern, like I said, read it through. Sometimes you might find some written patterns leave a lot up to your imagination. They assume that you know a certain base set of crochet information, like you begin with a slip stitch before you chain a foundation chain row. Um, that can really mess you up if you don't know a lot about crochet yet. And if you read some of the super old crochet magazines from the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, they're hilarious. They say things like chain 40, work in work in traditional stitch for 10 rows, uh, you know, and, and you're going, well, what's the traditional stitch? Like it just... <laughs> It just makes all these assumptions about what you may or should know. And that can be really frustrating. So little things to keep in mind are if you just see, if, it, if you're just told to start with chains, start with a slip stitch. Um, it, should be, it should be common knowledge if you've done any kind of crochet up to this point, but if you're new to it, you wouldn't necessarily know and you shouldn't feel dumb for not knowing because why would you if you just started to learn this stuff? And that goes for all sorts of layers in patterns. I'm still running into patterns where I'm going, what now? <laughs> so it's it's a constant evolving language and it's a constant learning curve. Um, another thing is that you'll typically see it in rows. So it'll start you with row one. Maybe there's specific instructions for the first few rows. Then you might see something that says row one to or row six to row 47. Repeat row two. So row six to row 47. You can do one of two things, have a little stitch counter with you or just keep counting your rows or mark your rows, the end of them with a stitch mark or something, any kind of way that helps you keep track of how many rows you've done. And when it says something like repeat row two, that means for rows, row six, you repeat row two, for row seven, you repeat row two, for row eight, you repeat row two. You just keep repeating row two as many times as it takes to get to row 47 or whatever the end of that little instruction is. And it, should be one of those things that gets into your head after a while. Like, yeah, I know what row two is. I've done it like 80 times now. But if you don't, you go back and you look at row two and you do all of row two. So whatever row two starts with and ends with, you do the whole thing. You don't do part of it. You do the whole thing. Um, so that's that's a common thing found in patterns. <laughs> Mr. Noise. <laughs> Interruption. <laughs> We have a two. We have two super chats. Oh my goodness! That have come in. Two, golly. So I wanted to get to these. Um, the first one is from. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Sure, sure, Torah. Sure, Torah. Sure, Torah. Sure, Torah. Yeah. Okay. I hope you're saying that. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. <laughs> uh, 
Shertora says, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the advice. I'm just now learning how to read patterns after 20 years of crochet. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. Yeah. You can always learn something new. Always. I love that. Uh, I actually, have... we've had lots of comments about people that have been crocheting for 10, 20, even up to 30 years, and they're still learning new things uh, on the internet, via, it's so via YouTube, great. friends. I love so, learning something new. I just, yeah. I feel so good when I learn something new. <laughs> um, our next super chat is from Tammy. Hi, Tammy. Thank you. And Tammy says, good morning from South Australia. Hey, good morning. Thanks for your super helpful insights. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> and before you get going, I think another one came in. Uh, yes, a super chat from Linda. Linda, thank you. <laughs> okay, so hopefully we're going to cover most of the common things that are found in the instructional part of a pattern. But if you're just joining us now, I also want to reiterate that we're going to do a live tutorial about a week from now, and we're going to go through this specific written pattern. It's available on our website on the Pattern Workshop page. It's the Moss Stitch Dishcloth. So it's a real basic little thing. It's... Um, it's just basically us working the same kind of row over and over again, but it's going to give you an idea of some of the common things that you'll find in most patterns. So like we have just finished saying, if you're told to repeat a row, so row for, you know, row three to row 20, repeat row two, that's all you do. You just keep repeating row two. And when we're doing tutorials, you'll frequently hear me say that. Okay, guys, you're just going to keep repeating rows two and three, and I'll see you at the end of row nine. You heard that a lot last year if you did the Victorian stitch sampler along with us. A lot of stitch patterns are made up of two rows, three rows, five rows that repeat. So if you're told to repeat rows two and three or two, three, and four, or repeat rows two through ten, maybe it's a real big repeater, that's all you do. You count out, if it helps, how many rows you know you need to have, or you just keep track of it every single time you do a row. You mark it with a stitch marker, you make a little note on your pattern, you have a little little um, row counter, whatever you need to do to keep track, and that's what you do when you get told, repeat so this row so many rows, or so many times. That's very common. Uh, another thing you might see frequently in the body of a pattern, which ne isn't necessarily so the math, this is what I call the math of a pattern, may not necessarily be explained anywhere else in the pattern. And it's a question we get a lot. What does star to star mean? What are the brackets inside of a let, like a, a sentence of instruction mean? What does it mean, you know, HDC twice, then <laughs> this is why I say, say it out loud and Speak it in the full, the full word. So if you see SC in second CH, look at the stitch legend if you don't know what SC and CH mean, and then go, oh, SC means single crochet. CH means chain. So that sentence should read single crochet in the second chain from the hook. When you say it in plain English out loud to yourself, it's a lot easier to visualize and it's a lot easier to actually do it. So you've chained your length. You read the next row in total and you go, okay, so I'm looking for the second chain from hook. There it is. And now I'm double crocheting or I'm single crocheting into it, whatever the actual instruction is. Just think of yourself doing a tutorial along with us and it'll, it'll help. It'll help make sense, but definitely read it out loud to yourself. If you see stars, so you're looking at a line of text, a line of instruction in a, in a pattern, and it says, let's say, two single crochet in the second chain from the hook. Chain one, star, two single crochet in the next chain, chain one, skip a chain, two, sh and then another star, and then it says something like repeat from star to star. You repeat everything that's in between those stars over and over and over and over again until you're told to stop. So typically the line will say repeat till end of row, you know, repeat for three rows, repeat five times, whatever the instruction is. You repeat whatever's happening between those two stars in its totality. So you go back to the first star and you go two single crochet into the next chain, chain one, skip one. Oh, there's the star. Re go back to the first star, two single crochet into the next chain, chain one, skip one. Whatever the instructions are, you repeat everything in between those two stars. Not before it, not after it. You just focus on what's in between those two stars for as long as you're told to. 
then you can move on. So if it tells you repeat from star to star five times, do that. Finish with the fifth repeat and go, okay, what's next? Ah, I'm at, I should be at the end of the row. Yes, I am. You should have two chains left. Yes, I do. And then whatever that the rest of that instructional line tells you, that's what you do. So that's what stars typically mean. Brackets. So we're going back to, and I was this... Is this abstract math? What what year of math was this? Was high school math? Is that the same as parentheses? Yes, parentheses. Okay, so there were some questions about that. So parentheses is the fancy appropriate, the proper word for brackets, sort of the, the rounded brackets that you see in a sentence. So, for example, if I was saying, "Oh, I like to, I like to have breakfast in the morning," so long as it's you know uh, you know, and by breakfast I mean you know, eggs or, or whatever it is, you might see a sentence that some of it appears in those rounded brackets. Those are parentheses. So parentheses are frequently used in patterns. They might show up at the end of a line of text telling you how many stitches you should have in the row. They may be used in the middle of the instructional sentence. And if you see them in the middle of the instructional sentence, this is high school math coming back to haunt you. Whatever you see in those brackets, you do. You do before you do anything else or you do everything, the entirety of that, what's in those brackets into the next stitch, the next chain, whatever is written next to the brackets. And sometimes you might find brackets in between stars, but we'll get to that. So for example, if in the brackets you see for the granny square, every time you get to a granny square corner, you work three double crochet, chain two, three double crochet, chain one before you leave. In a pattern that would probably be written, parentheses, three double crochet, comma, chain two, comma, three double crochet, comma, chain one, and parentheses, into the next space. So everything that's in those parentheses, three double crochet, chain two, three double crochet, chain one, gets done whoop, into the next chain or into the next space or into the next stitch, whatever is written next to that parentheses. So everything in the parentheses gets slammed into that one little place. It's a it's a way to, to neatly tell you what you're doing into one spot. And because so much crochet is stitches and chains and spaces all kind of built on top of each other or all worked into one space or one corner or a stitch, that's a frequently used Math concept basically is putting a bunch of information or instruction in between parentheses. So everything that you see in the parentheses, you do all of that into the directed area, whether it's a stitch or a chain, whatever. If you see this in between stars, and you should be sort of get where this is going now. So you know that whatever happens in between the stars, you do all of it and you repeat it however many times you're told to. So let's say your instructional line says, star bracket or parentheses three double crochet chain one and parentheses into the next three spaces parentheses three double crochet chain two three double crochet chain one and parentheses into the next space star so it looks like a lot first of all you're going to read it all out loud you're going to say all the full words not just the little short forms until it makes sense to you three double crochet, chain one, in parentheses. Well, that means I have to do everything in the parentheses where I'm directed to, into the next three spaces. Oh, okay. So I go three double crochet, chain one, into the first space, three double crochet, chain one, into the next space, three double crochet, chain one, into the third space. Oh, okay. The next thing you come up to is parentheses, three double crochet, chain two, three double crochet, chain one. Oh, into the next space. Okay, so I do everything in that in that space or in those parentheses into the next space. So I'm telling you kind of the pattern of a granny square. That would be a corner. Then you've run up against the star and the instructions say repeat from star to star till end of row. So you go back to the beginning of the star, which happens to be the three double crochet chain one in parentheses into the next three spaces. So you do that, do everything in the next set of parentheses and then you're back up against the end of the star. It's like bookmarks, bookends. Oh, gotta go back, reply, like, re, like a typewriter, go back to the first star and keep repeating. So if instructions appear in parentheses, typically that's everything you have to do into the next space or the next stitch 
or into the little area that's defined right after the parentheses. And if it's happening in between stars, it's just part of a longer repeating pattern. You just work through it one little thing at a time, say it out loud, don't be overwhelmed by it. I think this is a typical common response to reading a pattern is to go, okay, there's brackets, there's stars, there's commas, there's all these short forms. I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't wanna do it, I just wanna go watch a tutorial. No, <laughs> you can do this. Lay it down, read it out in plain English. So say it out loud to yourself and it'll make sense. And then actually tell yourself, okay, don't just say, okay, three double crochet, chain one. Say, what's three double crochet? Oh, I know what that looks like. I know what three double crochet looks like. Chain one, okay, into the next space. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I know that. That's like, a, that's like a shell, that's, that's a shell. Say it out loud until it makes sense to you because crochet, like knitting and a lot of other hobby crafts is just sort of the same concept done over and over again, mixed with different little, like the different stitches are basically just looping and pulling, looping and pulling. So remember that it's just looping and pulling and looping and pulling. And maybe you're looping and pulling five times in one place, or maybe you're looping and pulling once in a place. It's just the same thing over and over again. So don't let it intimidate you because it's, it's not, it's just yarn, <laughs> yarn and a hook. Don't be intimidated by it. So that's the most commonly found instructional concept in a pattern that confuses most people. So the use of stars or asterisks, that's what they're also called, and the use of brackets or parentheses. Parentheses, parentheses will sometimes also have the stitch count at the end of a row. And it's been my experience that a good pattern keeps you up to date with the stitch count. So if stitch counts matter, they'll indicate that at the end of the row or at the end of a section it's where this is the count you should be at. That's really great because it helps keep you on track and it's super important to count. So if a stitch count is in is included in the pattern, make sure you count, make sure you have the right stitch count and keep doing that as you go. Because if you ignore it and you think, ah, you know, I, I know what I'm doing, I'm in a hurry or this is fun or I don't want to, I don't want, I'm bored, I don't want to count, I don't want to waste my time. You could potentially run into trouble later on if your stitch count wasn't right. And if stitch count matters, <laughs> you're gonna have troubles if your stitch count is wrong. Same thing with measurements. If a pattern is constantly giving you, okay, at this point, this is what it should measure, take out your measuring tape and measure it. It's so important to make sure that you're doing exactly what the pattern tells you as you go and don't get don't get high on yourself and think, oh no, I know what I'm doing, or I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna jump ahead, or I'm just to ignore that, or I'm just gonna plow through it, because it might not turn out the way you want it to, and then you could get very frustrated, or you might think there's something wrong with the pattern. What's the motto again? Read it, really do read it through. <laughs> How about before you do read it through? Oh, oh, I like that too. Mm -hmm. Before you do, those are both good. <laughs> before you do read it through. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's your, that's, and then, and then most patterns will have like little breakdowns. They might say, you know, this is section one, or this is the back of the sweater, or this is the main build of the blanket. Here's the border. Different parts of the pattern will be kind of broken off from each other, which is nice. It's kind of like if you were reading a recipe, it gives you, you know, the entire cake. And then the frosting might be a separate little piece of the same recipe, but it has like its own little set of ingredients and its own little set of, of instructions. It's, it's basically the same thing. A pattern is like a recipe. It's a recipe for making a blanket. Sometimes patterns will also include tips, tricks, uh, fun things you might want to try. These are usually at the end. So that's kind of given you the opportunity to make the project as it was intended and typically as it was photographed. But once you're comfortable with the stitch pattern or the project or whatever it is, the author might say, okay, now that you've done it this way, you might also want to try it this way. You know, use this hook and this kind of yarn or use this set of colors or for a really fun variant, you know, try this. And it's kind of a neat way to get more mileage out of the same pattern. Um, kind of like with our little chick, our little chick drawstring sack. Um, the pattern we wrote up for it gives you exactly this here, but there's also a little chicken variation. So instead of being able to make a chick, you can also make like a mama chicken. <laughs> um, and that's part of the fun little tips and tricks section at the bottom of the pattern. Because sometimes you, you as an author, you can see fun variants or you've tried things and you don't necessarily wanna 
rewrite the whole pattern, but it gives you little instructions or little directions to modify the pattern um, without too much work. And it's a lot of fun. And it's and if you it's the kind of thing you want to get more out of, then read the fun little tips and tricks section because um, there's other things you can do with a pattern sometimes. Um, and I think that's most of what you will typically find in a crochet or even a knitting pattern. They're both basically constructed the same way. So if you are familiar with one and not the other, try it. They're both very similar. Um, and if you do want to start, you know, reading crochet patterns or reading knitting patterns, I first of all, start. Just grab one. Read it through, beginning to end. Read the stitch legend. Write things down. It's very handy to have a pen or a pencil with you and to make notes all over your stitch, like your patterns. Um, my early patterns, when I first started reading patterns, I had notes all over the place. I would indicate which yarn I used, which yarn I didn't like, um, the hook I used, the specific brand of hook that I used, just in case I came back to it later and I wanted to do it again. Um, anything that I found didn't work right, or if I found that there was a part in the pattern that I didn't, I, I changed because I felt that it worked better just for the way that I had a tendency to, to make my stitches or something, I would make notes. So it's always good to have a pen handy when you're going through a pattern to make notes for yourself. Read the whole thing out, start to finish, say it out loud, say it out loud in full speak to yourself. Read every single section before you start and then tell yourself to relax and just take it easy. And if you get up to things like parentheses and asterisks, read the whole thing through, look for the specific directions, and then just say it out loud and do it. And it'll make sense, especially if it's like for a whole row, you know you have to work that whole row. <laughs> so if you only work five stitches and you only get five stitches in, you're, and you think to yourself, well, what about the rest of the row? Look for stars, look for instructions that say repeat, you know, until the end of row, things like that. Most patterns are very logical because they follow a mathematical equation. There's a lot of math in crochet and knitting. So it should be logical and rational. That's what most patterns are like. All right, let's get some questions going here. Mr. and Stitches, I would be happy okay, to Okay, well, the one, that's, the one that has popped up recently and is being discussed is in regards to the chart chart style patterns. Yeah, that's a conversation for another day. That's a whole yeah, other that's a completely different conversation thing. and video. Yeah, so we're and, talking about written patterns today, not yeah, charts. So charts we'll, are we'll get into that another yeah, time. We'll definitely do charts another time. But. Um, <laughs> One thing at a time. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me see what I can find here. Um, and I can't also stress enough while Mr. Stitches is looking for questions. Like we said before, we have lots of free patterns over on our website and we'll put that link everywhere so that you can check it out. Um, first of all, start collecting patterns. It is so much fun to create your own project journals and have patterns of things you want to try. Um, they're great for a rainy day or a day with no electricity, or if you happen to be traveling and you can't use your phone or your devices, having written patterns is wonderful. And having a collection of them is really neat. It's, it's, um, it's a tangible attachment to our history. I love paper patterns. So print them off, start a little project journal. Most of our written patterns have a tutorial that goes with them. So if you're still getting used to reading patterns, pull up the pattern, pull up the tutorial and just follow along. We tend to structure our tutorials the same way we write up our patterns. So there's a material section. Our introduction is usually us sort of giving you a little bit of information about the pattern, the reasons you might wanna make it or the yarn you might wanna try. Um, and then when we get into the pattern, we say, the same way it's written, like, okay, we're on row one. This is what we're gonna do. At the end of row one, you should have so many stitches. You must hear me say that over and over and over again. <laughs> um, and so that's, you know, good. And then read it, pause the video, read the pattern, go, yeah, 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 that makes sense. And uh, it'll help because you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to visualize what you're actually reading. And that just goes so far towards being able to understand patterns of all kinds. Uh, the other thing um, was, I think, because there's so much information coming at everyone mm -hmm. at the moment, um, we, I just want to let everyone know, you can reiterate that this is good. This is part one, part one of how to read pattern. Next week, we're going to do a live tutorial and we're going to do this together and follow along through the whole pattern together. 
so that you'll be able to see what I'm talking about um, as we create it. So this is sort of part one. It's the introduction to reading a pattern. It's like, you know, a university class or something. <laughs> and that moss stitch <laughs> pattern is available on our website it's free. for yep. free. Go grab it. Anyone can grab it and download it for free. You can view it, and on, try it. on your phone yeah. or iPad or a tablet, or you can also print it out. Give it a whirl. If before we do it, we're going to do the tutorial. So know that there's a tutorial coming, but before we do it, why not give it a try and see if you can figure it out? Because holy smokes, when you actually figure something out and you realize it works it's like happy dance time <laughs> i love oh, that feeling okay so let's get to some questions in regards to reading patterns um if anyone has anything that um jada didn't cover or wants her to elaborate yes, on something anything i didn't cover um let us know in the chat and and i also want to say too um because patterns are all written by individual people they're obviously all not going to be identical. So what we're talking about here today are the common things you will find in a written crochet pattern. So most crochet patterns follow a certain formula. You're gonna see differences and variations between patterns. Can yes. I also mention that there are a lot of patterns out there that have errors yes and have typos yes and that can be confusing so you know you might just keep in mind that sometimes you might think you're losing your mind and it's not you but it's just a typo <laughs> or yes. something like that so keep that in mind yeah and you know authors are human <laughs> people too sometimes they're so into the project themselves that they won't even see the mistake that they yeah made. and i mean the internet is full of free patterns full. um every time you buy a, a ball of yarn there's a free pattern on yes. we, we've even found typos on those Patterns. Yes, yes. Just recently, I got a ball of yarn and I found some some complete inconsistencies in between what was written on the outside of the label and what was written on the inside. Yeah, of the label. so just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, it does happen. Yeah. Oh, and um, how you get your patterns might sort of influence where the information is found. So if you have a pattern book or a pattern magazine, the legend, so the stitch guides, the legends, stuff like that, if it's common information that applies to all patterns, a particular stitch legend will maybe be at the beginning or the end of the magazine or the book. It won't be on every single pattern. So they're assuming that you're going to know to go to the end, look up the bibliography, look for the, the appendix, the stitch legend, whatever might be at the beginning or the end of the book. So read the whole book or the whole magazine because information could be hiding. Okay, so here's, uh, this is from Jay Rich. Okay. Can you explain repeats? Yes. So uh, many patterns give you something like crochet 12 plus six until desired length. Yes. Um, that is, there's so repeats come in a whole bunch of different versions. If you're told crochet, you know, 12 rows plus six or until desired length, it's telling you to say, repeat the last 12 rows or repeat that stitch pattern. Um, Repeat row two to row 10 until you reach row 40 or until desired length. You'll see that frequently. That means if you're told to repeat rows two to 10, you go, you work row two, row three, row four, row five, row six, row seven, row eight, row nine, row 10, row two, row three, row four. You just keep repeating that entire sequence. Maybe it's just row two, maybe it's rows two and three, maybe it's rows two to 20, whatever it is, you keep repeating it for the number of times it tells you, repeat two to 40, six times. Repeat row two to 40 until it measures, you know, six inches. If it's about measurements, you need to have your measuring tape handy. If it's just about row count, you just count your rows or keep stitch markers on it so that you can kind of keep track of where you're at. Repeats come in a lot of different formats. Um, the differences between terminology, US versus UK, mm -hmm. for example. So, because, uh, crochet terminology grew organically with the people who were crocheting, um, you will have different term. you'll come in across different terminology depending on where you're reading your patterns, so what country they're from, what decade they're from, uh, what language they were originally written in. We have a translation chart on our website on the tools page. We have um, UK versus US terminology. So the stitch and its definition for, you know, whether it's US to UK or UK to US, we have that over on the tools page. You can highlight it and print it off. So it should be able to just like right click and print that picture and that and just keep that in your project journal, especially if you collect magazines or books um, written in English. Typically, um, if they're 
from Britain. They will typically be in UK terminology, not always. Um, there are a lot of UK uh, authors out there that are writing in US terminology because it's, I'd say, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to say that they're both, like, one's used more than the other. My great grannies were British, so I kind of understand the British terminology, and I had more to do with that because of a lot of the patterns and books I was getting were British first. So I started sort of learning the UK terminology to begin with, but then more and more and more that I came across had the US terminology. Um, the differences are <clears throat> not huge, but they're big enough that they will really change the outcome of a pattern. <laughs> um, so for just, just for simplicity's sake, we recommend you check out that, that chart on our tool page. There's a lot of great charts on that tool page, print them all off. Um, you just right click on the actual picture, right click, and it'll say, you know, print, just print that picture or print the image and just put them all in your project journal. There's a head sizing chart. There's a, oh, there's a tool, a hook conversion chart. So, you know, millimeters to US terminology to Japanese terminology, all of them. Um, I print them all off, keep them all on hand because um, the more you start diving into written patterns, the more it's helpful to have those little cheat sheets handy. Okay, um, and that is on the tools page, the tools page. Yeah. of our website. Yeah. The tools page, <laughs> not the pattern workshop page. <clears throat> no. Um, you may have answered this, I'm not sure, but I'm going to repeat it. Sure. Um, please explain what any number times six means. Oh, multiples. Okay, remember grade three or two or four, whatever grade it was for you, when you had to do your times tables, one times one is one, one times two is two. One times three is three. You know, that stuff that you were just sort of saying in your, your head at night. Yeah. So multiples are just your times tables. So if a pattern says, this pattern stitch can be worked over a foundation chain row that's any multiple of six plus three. What they mean is your foundation chain row should be any multiple of six. Six times two, six times three, six times 10, six times 400, any multiple of six or six times any number. Then you add three or two or whatever the extras. Sometimes there are no extras, but if it says plus three, they mean right at the end. They don't mean six plus three. They mean six times 15, great big long chain, plus three chains on the end. And those extra turning chains, so when you see anything, you know, any number times a number or any multiple times a number, plus two, plus three, plus one, it's just for the foundation chain row. It's just the turning chains you need to begin the stitch pattern. It has nothing to do with the rest of the stitch pattern. It's just the number of chains you need to establish that stitch pattern. So anytime you see number, you know, at your chain length, that's any number, any multiple of six or any multiple of three or any multiple of 15 plus an extra number, Focus on the times table, focus on the multiplication first. I want this to be 36 inches long. Okay, how many sets of 15 can I work into 36 inches? Get your measuring tape out, chain 15, chain 15, chain 15. Keep doing that until you get close to 36 inches and then add the extra turning chains. One, two, three, whatever it tells you to. So anytime you see a multiple, it's your times tables, that's it plus the extra few little chains on the end. And you're gonna see that everywhere. And once you unlock that secret, oh my gosh, you can do everything. <laughs> have a calculator handy too. We have a super chat. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's from Tammy. Hi, Tammy, thank you. <laughs> uh, Tammy says, lots of YouTubers use US terminology. Mm -hmm. So many magazines are taking that into account these days. Yes, yes, a lot of them do. I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not really sure why, but it does seem to be very, very popular. Um, but it's helpful to know both because like I said, the world of the written pattern is gargantuan. It is so much larger than what's currently available in tutorial form or photograph form or even blog form on the internet. And if you come across like your grandmother's old books and patterns, or you find some really old magazines, like I've got a handful of magazines from the thirties. They're big, you know, women's day stitchery magazines from like the twenties or the thirties. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. And they have all different kinds of, of, you know, thread craft in them. 
And sometimes being able to do these old vintage crochet patterns is such a treat because they're really different. They're really vintage. They are legit part of a particular look that was, you know, so significant to a particular era or decade. And knowing the stitch language that they were written in allows you to recreate it. And that can be so satisfying. It's just so neat. Um, I have a question here from Alaska Crafty Gal. Alaska Crafty Gal. Okay. <laughs> How come in some patterns, when it says crochet into the second chain from the hook, mm -hmm. some people go into the chain right next to the hook, and some people go into the second chain from the hook? So if a pattern says crochet into the second chain from the hook, you count that many chains back. You never count the loop that's on the hook. The loop that's on the hook is not a chain, it's not a stitch, it's just the working loop. So the very next chain that's off your hook is the first chain from the hook. And the next one next to that, the second, then the third, then the fourth, and so on. So the second chain from the hook is literally one, two chains away from the hook itself. You pull it off the hook. The loop that's on your hook doesn't count. So I don't know, you know, unless, unless maybe the, the camera doesn't look right or something, if someone's saying, we're going to crochet into the second chain from the hook, and they're accidentally doing the first one, it's just an error. Either they didn't mean to do it, or they don't fully understand that the second chain from the hook is two chains away. So if a pattern says the second chain from the hook, they need that one chain in between the hook and where you're working for the turn. That's the whole reason. So it's very difficult to work into the very the, to the first chain from the hook. There's no turning. You need the turning chain, and that's why it's there. And sometimes it's longer. <laughs> we have a super chat from Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, Sharon says, <laughs> love your videos. Thank you. <laughs> we love that you guys are spending some time with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so it's, it's over an hour. Oh, we should okay. probably wrap it up. Okay. So if you did have any extra questions, um, about patterns in general, please feel free to leave them in the description or the comment section down below. Um, we do try to get to comments at least once, sometimes even twice a week. So if you don't see it immediately, we will try and get to it. We do our best. One, but la one last question. Sure, yeah. One last question before we wrap it sure. up. Sure. This is from Kathy. Kathy says, my biggest problem is at the end of, at the end or the beginning of rows, I off, often end up dropping or losing stitches. Oh. Help. Okay. So sometimes that's common if you're just starting, like your foundation chains. One of the biggest reasons we, we mess up with our foundation, even if we've counted, we're like, I know I had 20 chains. It's because it twists on you. And sometimes you, you know, if the foundation chains twist... You're not really sure where the next one is or two might look like one. So trying to keep your foundation chain row flat helps a lot. And sometimes just keeping it flat on your desk while you work that first onerous row of the stitch pattern. If you slow down and do it right, it saves you for a lot of time down the future. If you're already into the stitch pattern, it could be that you're excited and you're skipping stitches or possibly Maybe you're using a big hook or it's a very strange kind of stitch pattern, one you're not used to, and you're accidentally using the same stitch a couple times. These are really common errors. I still do them myself. Um, it is really helpful when you're first getting used to a new stitch pattern because you're not really sure how it's going to look coming off your hook to really slow yourself down and count out loud. <laughs> I know that sounds funny and people might be going, oh my gosh, stop counting out loud. You're making me crazy. But counting out loud and really slowing down and making sure, okay, that's the next stitch. I have to skip it. Or that's the next stitch. I need to do this into it. Really slow down and pay close attention and count your stitches for at least the first few rows of the pattern. Or if it's a multi-row repeater, like it's a five-row repeater, do all five rows really slowly and then do all five rows really slowly again, just until you get used to how the pattern's gonna look. And that will help you kind of speed up as you go. But don't, just even if you're quick, let's say you've been crocheting for years and you really know your, you know, I know what a double crochet looks like. If you're starting into a completely new project or a new stitch pattern that you've never tried before, slow the heck down because you don't necessarily know how you're gonna look while it's coming off the hook. And you wanna get used to how things look first for a few euros before you speed up. And that'll help, that'll really help. Um, if you miss your turning chain, if you're told to work into the top of the turning chains, 
Turning chains typically try to hide. They try to sort of they curve down on the end of the row a little bit. So you might have to look over the edge of the end of the row for them um, and count. So if you're like, if it's 30 stitches, including the turning chain and you've worked 29, look for that turning chain. And if it looks funny or it looks a bit odd, make it work for you. <laughs> make something work as the turning chain and that'll keep your stitch count even and proper. And if a, if a pattern highlights the number of stitches you need to have, please make it happen because it, it just, it makes the pattern look right. <laughs> uh, very important. Yeah. Um, comment from Angela. You guys are awesome. Thanks so much for this chat. It's Thanks, cleared up a lot and Great. made me figure out where I went wrong. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> on some crochet and knitting patterns. Please be, be advised. You can go back and watch this whole thing again. I know it was a lot of information coming at you and this is only part one. So we're going to go ahead sometime next week, about a week from now, and we're going to do a pattern together. We're going to do this moss stitch dishcloth together. So it's just a simple dishcloth. Nobody should feel like they're going to panic. I'm not going to say, all right, we're going to do a whole blanket together. Just a simple dishcloth. I'm going to read through the pattern with everybody on camera so you can literally see what we're doing, what section we're on, how it looks when it's spilt out. And you can go get this pattern for free on our website and you can print it off and have it with you so that we do do it together next week. Um, you'll be able to look at your paper copy of it and go ahead and try it in the meantime, because hopefully something maybe you heard today has going to sort of help spur you on to try <laughs> I, a pattern. I encouraged everyone to go to our website, grab what Take them all. <laughs> whatever free patterns you want <laughs> and just, feels. you know, try it out. It's free and um practice and practice. it's nice to have us to start your project journal because yeah you just never know your when the lights collection. might go out <laughs> ding, ding. we have a super chat from samantha hi samantha thank you <laughs> samantha says rainy day here perfect weather for crochet and blanket work yes so you want to show everyone your uh, blanket I've got my there, big cozy keeping blanket. you warm? Yes. I don't know if any of you were watching us back in the beginning when we first started live streaming. This was the first blanket I made while we were live streaming. Show the bottom part, too. Um, it's a it, rainbow. Yeah. It's a rainbow. There's purple in there. And the whole thing is bordered in white. It was all my chunky weight yarn. And I just <laughs> ah, love it. And it's perfect. It's on warm and day. happy. It is real. It's colorful. warm and happy. Every time I look down at my lap, I smile. Dana likes all the colors. I do. I love all the colors. <laughs> uh, Samantha's super chat continues. It says, starting a new job soon. Wish me luck. Yay, congrats. Hey, good luck. That's awesome. Have a great week. Hugs and kisses from the USA. <laughs> oh, congrats <laughs> on the new job. Yeah, That's so congrats exciting. on the new job. <sighs> I love that. New jobs are new scary jobs are and exciting. Scary and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, I yeah. guess we'll wrap it up because yeah, there's so there's a lot of questions, but um, just repeat your question in the comments after this becomes a video. Yes. And, and we'll get to all of them. Hopefully we answered it or something that's similar to it in this um, this live stream. So feel free to go back and watch it over again because we did try to work our way through the general formula of a common crochet pattern. Um, grab whatever crap patterns you want from our website there. We've got a whole bunch of them there for free and most of them have a tutorial that goes along with it. We are going to do the moss stitch dishcloth together about a week from now. Yeah, we'll roughly do a live a week tutorial. From now. And the same thing, we'll be answering questions as we go. This was sort of an introduction to the concept of reading a pattern. Leave your questions in the comment section down below and I'll do my very best to answer them to the best of my ability. I can't answer questions on specific patterns that you might be reading somewhere else or looking at. Um, if you can get a hold of the author of a pattern, it's always best to ask them because everybody writes a little bit differently. But in general, I can try and help explain concepts to you because most, like I say, most patterns follow a similar concept. So that was kind of the introduction of this live chat today. I hope you guys found some of it helpful. Um, we will do the live tutorial together about a week from now. Until then, we- Oh, and let everyone know we have a, um, a bonus, a bonus video this week. We have a little treat yeah. for you guys tomorrow. We, I totally forgot. <laughs> We're going to be publishing an, another, another quick fix. A little quick fix tomorrow. Yeah. We have our Friday video coming, obviously. Um, in fact, which this, is the blanket. This Friday is our next calendar blanket um, um, edition for yeah. the 2019 calendar blanket, our folk art blanket. So well, that's this Friday. That'll be Friday. And we have a little quick fix treat for you tomorrow. So if you are 
you know, you need a little crochet pick me up partway through the day, then uh, we hopefully will have something that you might like. It's just a simple little project, yeah. but it's just a little crochet quick fix. Something that I love. So, so. That, that'll be up. That'll be up tomorrow. Um, I don't know during the day. Maybe tomorrow evening. We'll see. It'll it'll be morning for some people, evening for others, and afternoon for some. Yeah, yeah. We're not sure of the time, but it'll be tomorrow for it'll sure. It'll be tomorrow. Yeah. And yeah, next um, week will be part two. And part next week we're going to get into this even more. So, and then eventually we'll also talk about graphs. So reading a crochet <laughs> chart or reading a graph, those are also very handy, but they're kind of they're they you have to look at them differently. <laughs> so we will get to that though. Some viewers are asking for hints on the blanket, and it's like we do not give hints. Yeah. No, we kind of give. Sometimes, sometimes we, we do. Sometimes we give hints, but. I don't think we're going to give hints this week. This, this, uh, no. Not this, this is going to be super secretive. <laughs> this is, this is a secret week. It's a, a secret week. Secret mo month. Secret month. Yeah. I guess, I guess we can give one hint. It, it's going to be an applique. <laughs> that, that, yeah. It's going to be an It's going to be an applique. It's going to be a large applique. Oh, there's actually. a little bonus. There you hint. Go. That's all I'm going to say. It's going to be a large applique. And I'm so. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm having so much fun with this blanket, you guys. I hope you guys are having as much fun with it as I am. <laughs> okay, so that's it for this evening. I hope you guys had some fun with this. I hope you got a little bit of work done on whatever whip you have in your lap. Um, and I hope we helped answer some questions about the general concept of a crochet pattern and how a written pattern looks. We will get more um, in depth in this next week. Um, until then, please feel free to print off as many of the free patterns we have on our website on the crochet, the pattern workshop page as you want. Start yourself a journal um, and uh, maybe even give the moss stitch dishcloth pattern a try based on everything we talked about this evening. You'll be amazed at how it changes your outlook on a pattern if you just sort of follow the rules. It's like if you were going to work on a recipe, if someone handed you a recipe, they always say read the whole thing first because you don't want to be you don't want to be surprised. You don't want to be surprised by something. You want to know what's coming. And um, don't forget the helpful charts on the tools page. Yes, and we have a, a tools lot page there. too. A lot of helpful charts. You can right click and print image and print those things off, put them in your project journal too. They're helpful little cheat sheets. And that is it. We will see you guys tomorrow, actually, um, for a little quick fix. And then we'll see you Friday. <laughs> and then we'll do a live tutorial. And oh my gosh, we are so busy with crochet. It's going to be a busy week. It's a busy week. And I hope it's supposed to rain all week. Like, mm, I'm just so, <laughs> this is not a nice May. Uh, so it's a perfect week for doing some crochet with yeah. everybody. But uh, that's it. I hope you guys had fun. We will see you soon. Mr. and Stitches is going to play us out. Aww. I'm trying to warm up the room. I love it. <laughs> <laughs>